I have a question about the, um, the first presentation with the ropes and just curious how we know that the 25% of the pigs or the, that didn't interact with the ropes and then, and then a lot of those that subsequently died that maybe they didn't interact with the ropes because they were low blood glucose to begin with or hind teat nurses or, you know, how do, how do we know that it had anything to do with the ropes or they were maybe disadvantaged to begin with? Yeah, that's a great point. And I think that's something that would uh, need further investigation um, because as I was doing the, the interaction, who died and who touched data, that's exactly what popped into my mind. I said, okay, they didn't touch the ropes, but did they also not do anything else? Were they just laying next to mom? and doing absolutely nothing else. Um, so that's where um, this study is kind of like a proof of concept kind of information. So can we even get them to touch ropes? Anyone, any of the pigs, do they care about it? And the answer to that and what we found is yes. So now the next steps would be really digging into, okay, what is it about that piglet that did touch the rope or that did not touch the rope? And are there any, any interactions there with what their other behaviors are, or what their, their nursing behaviors are and stuff like that? And maybe to piggyback onto that point is, so we're focusing on the fact that the pigs that uh, die did not eat or did not get enough colostrum. Is it a, is it a result of uh, them not getting enough colostrum that they died or were they such low viability pigs or not active or not aggressive, therefore they didn't eat enough colostrum? And so should we focus more on what can we do to increase activity? One of the things, crazy ideas we came up with is to, uh, or in combination with Denny McKilligan's group, was to, to maybe dose those pigs at birth with a um, um, caffeine supplement to try to increase the, the activity of that pig to make them go and search out the teeth. I, I wanted to say just really quickly, um, so in my study, we did actually necropsy the piglets that died, and we looked at stomach, con stomach contents. Um, so I can't say we didn't identify colostrum versus milk since they were dying on day two. Um, but we didn't see any trends in like the ones that were crushed or that did die had all empty stomachs or anything. We had a, a something across the board on that. Um, and then yeah, those light pr piglets, they physically can't drink as much, right? So the advantage of the heavy birth weight piglet is that they can suck and suck and suck and they can clean out the whole teat. So even those light birth weight piglets, again, they're developmentally different at, at birth. Um, I like that idea. Our, our personal farm at Purdue has been using one of those uh, little colostrum supplement pump bottles that just high, high fat and energy in them, I think, and a lot of other things that are, I don't know exactly what all's in it, but our farrowing manager is just, firm believer that the really light birth pig is it, the one thing it does is get them up and get them at least going and getting to the teat on their own. So I like the idea of caffeine or whatever, get them going. <laughs> of caffeine. Interesting. First of all, thank you very much for all the hard work, the details, the, the double-handed uh, <laughs> feeding of two pigs. Uh, I, I think for everybody, first of all, I'd just like to have another round of applause for everybody that's been involved in spending that much time and energy to try and save a little pig. So thank you very much. Um, but I had a general question. You mentioned the uh, power, how many animals it takes to power up a study. And so I think all of us are challenged with, when we start looking at mortality or trying to measure that, there's a lot of variability. And so you do need a lot of animals. And some of the university studies can help us get further down the road as far as understanding some things, but you don't have the mortality occurring in universities or some of these intense studies. So, so is there a way for us to think through about how to connect the commercial, uh, the commercial operations along with the universities as well as the commercial companies that are developing products or processes in order to really study this idea of mortality and make those differences? Because what you were saying, Kara, uh, just so many times you're like, I've got a, I have some intuition that this might work. At the same time, I don't have the data because you might have run a good study, but you might have not have had that mortality occurring. So just maybe a general idea. 
Um, well, call us. <laughs> I mean, I think anybody on this grant is ready and, and willing to do things. But, you know, the upfront part is just the planning of what is realistic data that we can capture and what is not. How can we track piglets? Can we know, you know, we, the thing we run into with just partnering up is just cross-fostering and moving piglets a ton. And some of that makes it almost impossible to track piglets and see how we really do on certain, depending on what the question is. You know, if you're treating them in the first 24 hours and you're not cross-fostering until after 24 hours, then I lose the pig. And so, you know, it, it can just be a challenge to do, but not insurmountable. And so I think any of us are willing to, we need the partnerships, because I'm at that point with, you know, where do I go next in survivability of these piglets is, we need big numbers and, and a, you know, a good idea and big numbers to start looking at. So we need those partnerships and are ready. Yeah, just, just one other comment, and I'd, I'd echo exactly what you said, call us, because one of the things we can do from the university perspective is we've got lots of hungry, young, future swine nutritionists or swine uh, industry professionals that want to get in barns. And that's one of the things that really makes these commercial trials essential is getting people in those barns and getting the data collected. And so that's one thing that we can bring to that table that I think, again, with that partnership of suppliers in the industry, as well as the, the, the integrators out there that have the barns for us to be able to access, it makes a really, really strong team. So. And it's way easier to find people that want to come hold babies than those that want to collect boars. <laughs> speak, speak really clearly to that. So as you mentioned that, I thought of a word. Uh, is Noel Williams in here? But no, no, he's in the other session now. But uh, Noel Williams at ASV a couple years ago uh, mentioned the word coopetition. And so I think if we look at our systems, if you're a commercial company selling product or for university, please think about coopetition and collaborating as opposed to trying to be the, the first, um, so to speak, because we're, we're a lot better together. I appreciate you saying that because <laughs> These aren't trade secrets, and I don't want your trade secrets, but mortality is affecting all of us, and from an industry, we are going to be, from the consumer perspectives, looking in on us, we're all gonna be impacted together on this issue of mortality. So, you know, de-identify de all your data, but let's all get together and, and look at it together to make the best path forward. So, so I'll just add uh, a little to this is that um, at NFP, we've had the pleasure of doing a couple studies with both uh, internal uh, people, suppliers, and universities. And um, don't be afraid to ask them because it's a great labor source, uh, one. <laughs> um, but the, the, you're right, sow farms are really difficult, but I will tell you, we always uh, struggle with how are we going to get this done. But the great thing about working, uh, like Denny said, is if you bring the labor, you know, we'll open up the barn, students get some great experiences, or staff learns, and it's really positive, and, and we move forward. Um, but the challenge, like we've talked about a lot, is just that labor component. And, and I think we don't talk about it enough is this is all great data, but if we don't help our labor problems, we're going to start losing data faster because uh, the people that record things for me and my farms now are going to have to give up counting the number of teats and number of piglets, right? And we're gonna have to get back to some of the basics and I'm gonna start losing data faster than I need. And so we need um, this cooperation to get these things done and, and it works very well. So I would encourage others to do it. Yeah, just to kind of tag onto that, the labor and is, it's intensive, right? And you showed, I'm impressed with the, how if you get those lightweight pigs to drink enough colostrum significant impact on reducing the mortality. And then also your suggestion, parity twos and threes produce the most colostrum. So maybe we need to look at how we foster pigs more strategically. And with that, you know, what are we willing to give up? You know, because some of the data shows, well, fostering doesn't help those heavy birth weight pigs. But you know we need to rethink that because if we're not impacting their survivability, maybe just slowing them down. You know, if you consider some of the intermittent suckling with creep feeding, we intentionally slow them down. But at the end of the nursery, some of that data shows they compensate because we prepared them for weaning by intermit intermittent suckling, almost a sort of fasting, yeah. if you will. But then all they get 
in that time is creep feed. So maybe, you know, more holistic strategies to try to unravel all that complexity that you showed up there on the yeah. one slide <laughs> and what we're trying to achieve in terms of improving survivability. John, I love that because most of the data that is published stops at weaning and never follows the pigs further to see maybe I helped them get to weaning, but they all died the first week in the nursery for all I know. You know so, so I think the, the holistic approach is, is needed big time, I agree. I wanna think about cross-fostering strategies because the data doesn't suggest that we have the right method figured out to be the best. And it has to be simple enough that we can do it correctly in the barn all the time. So I welcome any brainstormings on what would be, what has worked? Has anybody done a cross-fostering strategy that has just greatly worked for them? And what is the best way to, to do that? So Kara, I have a farm, a 2,500 sow farm that has been tagging every pig at birth with the Leo system, with an RFID tag. So we take birth weights, wean weights on every pig. I've probably got 150,000 data points. I need someone to analyze data. <laughs> and so I'm just thinking this could be a great collaboration um, if we got together because with those Leo tags, I can tell you every pig um, that I scan, who its original mom was, who its fostered mom was, um, there's quite a bit of work involved on the girl finish side because we don't have a, a good way, you know, um, we have started scanning pigs that go out on first cut and finding interesting things. Like at one point we found um, a litter that, you know, we, 12 of the pigs or whatever that got on that first cut all happened to be litter mates and they, um, so, you know, the sow is long gone because at the point at which we find that out, she probably was culled because she had a lot of stillborns or something, you know. So um, there's tons of data points there. And yeah, I would love for you guys to take a look at those things. And in addition to that, doing research is easy because you can allocate pigs very easy to treatment groups with that system. Um, yeah, just tons of data and Please somebody needs to look me. at it. I, I already, <laughs> I got it. Not Jason, Come Kara. <laughs> well, and I can tell you, the gentleman sitting right next to you said the same thing to me a few months ago, that he said, I am data rich and knowledge poor. And I have, it, I have, Chad, it was Chad, it yeah, was. Exactly. And I have, I have kept that in my head ever since he said that, and we've actually figured out a way to help with some of their questions through some internships and, and some extra credit, that, or like a credit for, like research for credit that the students get back at Purdue when they come back and things. So I'm definitely, please email me, I love that idea. In the rope study with the milky cheese, the milky cheese was intended to get the piglet away from the sow to save its life. Uh, milky cheese sounds like a hard thing to harvest, a uh, hard thing to apply. In the old days of treating finishing pigs, they used pigs like licorice and they like root beer. Would spraying the sow's udder with licorice and, uh, and, uh, or root beer, some flavor, would a different flavor, A, be an attractant to get them away from the sow, or B, get them, be an attractant to get them to the teat end? because they're very aromatic and they might be cheaper and easier to administer than milky cheese. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. Um, the milky cheese in the study was something that was created by a feed additives um, company that we worked with over in Spain. Um, so that was something, we chose that because it had actually been used on newborn piglets before, which is there's not a lot of stuff out there that's giving data on that. So that's one of the reasons we chose that. Um, and you said licorice, which I think anise is the same thing, right? Yeah. I just putting that together. So there is, there's research on there, and that one I ended up not going with because some studies were great and some studies showed the exact opposite results. So it's really hard with all the, the individual variation things in there, but I mean, you're completely right that the right attractant is probably out there. We just kind of need to find it, and I think there's a lot of value in using what they, I mean, pigs can smell. That's, that's, the, that's the thing they got. So using what they have to help them uh, find the udder or go away from the udder so they don't get crushed, whatever the situation is. The idea of anise or uh, root beer came about when we were snaring pigs for pseudorabies and we wanted to coat the snare with a flavoring so they'd come to the snare instead of us having to snare them in the yeah, wild, you know. That's funny. And it's, it's interesting because there's so much difference in age of pig as well. So what works for a finisher pig, what works for a nursery pig, what works for a newborn pig, there's just not enough out there for us to, to really know. And so getting answers to that, that would be beneficial.
trying to remember what we collected in those studies that we did it in. Um, uh, at Purdue, we took blood. We took blood at birth, but not blood at 24 hours. I have to go back and look at when we took blood. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Is, does anybody know, I had heard a story that in Europe there is a blue spray chemo attractant that they spray on the udders of the sows and it's bright blue and it has something in it that's attracting the piglets. But the other thing is that when the piglets come and drink, their whole nose gets blue so you can walk by and see who's drank and who hasn't touched the udder yet. But I can't find it on Google. I'm not the world's best Googler, I should ask somebody who's 15. And I. I don't know what it is or if anybody has data or knows what that is. Perfect, perfect Green uh, gel product that you can buy from the site. I have the name of it. It's still Did you it's hook up with me? Thanks to Julia. I, I, uh, that was a lot of work in that study. Uh, and it's really refreshing to see a N of appropriate size in a study to bring clarity. Uh, but my question is for Kia, I've, I've asked her that before. Uh, now that you've gotten out and gotten into practice, and I heard yesterday that an interpretation of your data was we didn't feed them frequently enough. Uh, so how would, you f how would you feed peripartum sows now? What do you recommend now that you're out there and doing it? I think you asked me the same question in my defense, so thank you, Steve, for <laughs> taking me back. I want to see if your answers <laughs> change now that you got some experience. I don't think I would feed them ad libitum. Um, I would try and get three feedings in them. I think that's a practical application. I think first thing in the morning, a noon feeding, and right before you go home, and if you have an extended shift and you can have someone that can feed them at eight at night, that's what I'd do. Uh, Kia for you as well. Um, my question is, so it looked like by feeding more times or by feeding ad lib, you numerically did re reduce pre wean mortality. So with that in mind, should we, how long had they been loaded? So how many days were they on feed prior to farrowing? And then could that be a potential that we're getting more energy in these sows and does that drive more colostrum output? Lots of pieces to that. So in this particular study, I think we averaged two and a half to three days pre farrow So I know that that's probably longer than a lot of systems get. I do think that energy component to it, there is a piece. So the longer that they're loaded there and they have that, that extra energy of that diet, the extra amino acids of that diet, I think there could be something there in terms of colostrum production for those females. But I don't think we've proved that yet, that they, they make more colostrum. Um, but I think there, there is a sweet spot there too where we don't want them in there for so long pre farrow that you end up creating issues with ad libitum feeding or they're getting too much feed and too much energy there. I think there's probably a sweet spot. So I don't know if I have a great answer for you. Um, I think there could be more work in that particular area if there's an energy supplement or a caffeine or um, something that helps with pain mitigation in that particular period and try and predispose, the, predispose these females um, to be more ready for that farrowing period. Kia, did you uh, know, uh, I know there, there was an offer of a meal, and you noted mm -hmm. the time that they farrowed from that offer of meal. Mm -hmm. uh, did, were you able to note any difference in whether that sow actually consumed that feed when she was offered that meal, or was the, the timing of farrowing, did that prevent her from maybe consuming that meal? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what we did notice with that particular treatment is the first day that they were ad libitum, they would get up every time and eat. 
But as they increased that time that they're in the farrowing house, you'd see that behavior where those sows that were ad libitum were not getting up on their own. You physically needed to get them up and they got lazy per se. And so I think there is something about that feed being novel and new and them wanting to eat it and not so much that they're full all the time, um, but that it's, it's enough that they're still hungry to get up and eat that meal. So ad libitum, I, I think that might have impacted a little bit is they may not truly have eaten that meal. Anyone else? This might be more for Kara, and I don't want to let the geneticists off the hook, but when you talk about the maternal behavior impacts and those jumpier sows, do you think there's um, something we can do um, to, to calm sows, like whether it's like a chemical additive or like a, I don't want to say it, but like CBD or, <laughs> you know, is there anything, is there, do you think there's room for improvement on some of those behaviors with with different um, like neurological modifiers or something like that? Yeah, I think we need to understand which sows are the jumpier ones and which ones aren't. So, you know, a lot of times you see more jumpier in younger parity sows who maybe just had their first farrowing. And I think he is comment about pain mitigation for um, for some of these animals too. Maybe they're, maybe they're the ones that had a harder farrowing and they are more jumpy and they're in more pain and involution isn't happening as well. Or maybe it is just a true behavior. They don't handle stress well, and they are more jumpy, and we could do something neurologically. I think all of that is a great idea. Um, I just had a quick question on colostrum um, quality and quantity. So for these large litters, if we, <laughs> if, uh, if, if for the large litters, if we assume that every pig in the litter is getting the you know bare minimum amount, but not just the survival, but the thrival amount, does she have enough? So if you look at um, some of the data from Mark Knauer's lab and some of K-State data, one of you people, um, they, looked at the, um, they looked at the piglet to teat ratios. And if you look at the, if you look at, is that your data? Okay, if you look at Kia's graph, and I tried to draw a line at 300 grams of colostrum and what the teat ratio had to be for 100% of the piglets to get that. It was at your one to two piglet to teat ratio for every piglet to get the, the thriving level of colostrum. Now, in our studies, I would say that most of them are getting it. I mean, a good portion of piglets are getting 300 grams of colostrum in the first 24 hours in our small data sets. So that's probably not completely true. Um, but I think for sure, you know, you think about those piglets on the back end of the sow, even if they're the bigger pigs, they're still not maybe getting their, their best amount, and we're changing their developmental trajectory just as much as the light birth weight. So, um, so I do think that on average, the sows are producing enough to get everybody about right at the, the survival and thrive levels, but not really well beyond it. And Bartolozzo's data, you know, there were some of those sows that, or piglets that were up there in like four and 500 grams. Of the, most of those tended to be more on the heavy birth weight side. Um, so I think the big pigs are for sure getting it, but those middle weights and light weights probably aren't all getting it. Okay, I'm Bernardo Andrade for uh, Professional Sun Management. And really nice information, but my comment is about labor. Every time that I hear something in my mind go to labor, extra process, extra labor, and if we are not addressed that one like an industry, we will have more hunters than dogs. Because in this information, I would like to see what is the staffing level. Right now, the industry is running farms with 70, 60% of staffing, and that is hard to implement some stuff, some of these really good ideas. And, and we can have really good uh, information, and we are losing the, the comment, we can lose data because we don't have the staffing on the farm. What we're doing like an industry, what the, the pharmaceutical companies, the university, is doing to attract more labor to the farms. In science, we are fine. We need more labor. When the, in the, in yesterday in, in the presentation, we look at labor, technicians, He's a person to make in more PSY than, than the, the manager. What are we are doing to attract that people to our farms? That was my comment. 
Yeah, I mean, maybe maybe just two points. It's, a, it's an excellent question. It's definitely something that we've been talking about for the last two days, but maybe biased a little bit, but I think that's one of the, the, the highest values of this whole pig survivability project. And you saw it yesterday when Jason Ross uh, had his lead-off presentation, I think at the end as well too, but you'll notice how many people were involved with this whole project from graduate students and undergraduate students. I think we talked about it when we began the, the question and answer session as well. Once you get people into those Farron houses and they start playing with those little pigs, all of a sudden you have someone, you've, you've won them in that particular case. And so I, I think it's something that we as an industry definitely have to do it and, and make sure that they know the opportunities that are inside those barns. Because lots of times we try to keep it a secret, right? We're not wanting to let people know what it's really like in there. And so we're letting them form their own conclusion then of what it's like if we don't help show them. You know, the other, the other part of that I think though is also not only the amount of labor, but making sure the labor is doing the right things. And that has to be part of the, the continuation of, of this research is making sure that especially in times when we're short, that they're doing the things that have the biggest impact on productivity or the li livability of the, of the pigs in those operations well too. And I think probably right now there's a lot of things that are going on in these farms that maybe we don't have to be spending the time doing that as opposed to chicken sows and pulling pigs and those types of things as well. Any other last questions or comments or recommendations for research for us? This is the one that I've always worked on or looked at. Um, you know, we talk about induction and days of farrowing. What is the correct days of farrowing nowadays? 20 years ago, we were 114, 115. Now, 20 years later, we're still there. Talk about small pigs. Do we, is it 116, 117, 118? And what effect is it from conception to market versus wean age and you know that that kind of thing? So you know, are we doing any studies or work on that? Yeah, thanks. And that's a really good question, and especially falls back in a lot of what Kara's been doing as well too. And you know, a lot of these trials where we whether do induction or we purposely don't, what we've been seeing is where we're one fifteen and a half is probably our average uh, uh, gestation length right there. But we'll have some sows that'll go. 116, 117, you know, even 118 in some situations as well. And so definitely that 114 day is, is in the past. We need to be moving on and taking that off of our calendars, I think, and, and making sure we're not inducing too early. Okay. I agree 100%. And I find that to be counterintuitive. As litter sizes have gone up, you'd think that considering that cortisol and stress of the piglets induces the farrowing process to begin, but more piglets in there is making our gestation length longer and not shorter. But uh, the reason like for the difference in the Purdue versus the Mashoff's day of induction was based on the non-induced herd average. We only went one day ahead of the non-induced herd average, not more than that to, to induce, because we do know that could be detrimental. So why is gestation length getting longer and not shorter with more pigs? 